Okay. Revolution time. Volume of evolution. Okay. What is one of those? So I've just drawn a set of axes, Cartesian, of course, and I've just labelled this as a genetic curve, y equals f of x. Okay. Now, in integration, you've been able to work out the area bounded by the curve and the x-axis between limits of x equals a and x equals b, haven't you? What if we do something different with it? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this curve, okay, I'm going to rotate it two pi radians around the x-axis. Always radians when we're using calculus, remember, okay? So two pi radians around the x-axis, okay? So like that. I'm sorry, I did that twice. <laughs> Should have done it once, really, didn't I? So if we rotate it just once, one complete term, basically, two pi radians, 360 degrees, okay, around the x-axis, okay? What sort of shape does this make? What sort of shape is traced out? It's a 3D shape, isn't it? Okay, it's a weird looking 3D shape, granted, but it's still a 3D shape, okay? We can work out volumes of 3D shapes by using integration. Okay, so integration comes up all over the place. It's not just about areas now, it's about volumes of shapes as well. Okay. And we're going to do that using integration. I'm going to show you the method for it. Okay. Right, what we're going to do is we're going to divide this up into different segments, okay? Like we did with integration. Okay, remember integration is an infinite sum of rectangles all added together. Okay, that's what integration is, and it gives you a to total area, okay? What we're going to do is something a little bit different, okay? Um, I'm going to hopefully, look, I'll just show you what it looks like on the, um, on the bottom here. Uh, let's try and get the mirror image of that look right. That's not bad, is it? Okay, that's not bad, okay? So, just bear with me. So I've never introduced it this way, it's just a thought just occurred to me right now when I was thinking about it. I'm going to give this one a go. Uh, if it turns out to be rubbish, I'll re-record the video and do it my traditional way, okay? But if it works out well, I'll just keep it, okay? What we're going to do is um, we're going to just slice it up, okay? So imagine just slicing this up. You're going to get effectively what look like circular discs, aren't you? Can you imagine that? Because remember, you're rotating the shape. Hence, that's not much good, is it? Because you can't see this. There, might as well do it like that. You can see the circle then, yeah? You get the circular shape when you rotate this curve, aren't you? All the way around the x-axis, okay? Um, and when it's gone half a turn, it's down by there, and when it's full turn, it's gone all the way back, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to divide this into circular disks, okay? Like that, okay? Let's see if I can just try and draw one of these out nicely. That's all right, okay? But this is a circular disc, okay, that I've actually traced out, okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to call the width of this, can you ever guess? Delta x. Remember in calculus, we're always using delta to represent a small change, okay? Delta's come up a lot in calculus, okay? So we're going to represent delta x to represent a small change in the x direction, okay? So the thickness is delta x, and you can see what we do with delta x later on, can't you? I hope so. At some point, delta x will go to zero. And that's where the d's come from, which is great. Okay. Now, I don't want that line there because it's in my way. Okay. What about this bit here? Now, why is that bit crucial? Okay. Well, I said we'd break it up into disks. Okay. The correct mathematical term for the shape that is a disk is really a cylinder. Okay. How do you find the volume of a cylinder? Yeah, you had until I wrote it out until you could answer, okay? It's pi r squared h, isn't it? Pi r squared h is the volume of the cylinder, okay? The h is basically this bit there, okay? If you imagine that the cylinder looks like this, okay? There we are, okay? That's the h bit there, okay? And then the radius, what's that? From the centre to the, effectively the circumference, okay? Because if the top of it is a circle, you can have... Anyway, so this bit here is going to be the radius, isn't it? Okay, that's basically what the y coordinate is. Okay, and it's important that I leave it y because the values of y are going to change throughout. Okay, delta x, wonder is I'm just picking on a particular, just one um, disc that's somewhere in between there and there. Okay, and all the widths are the same. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide it up 
um, equally so that I've got delta x, delta x, delta x, delta x, you know, hundreds and thousands of them, because delta x is you know, really, really small, millions of them, okay? And eventually delta x tends towards zero, but the y value is always changing, isn't it, okay? So if you imagine that this is the first disk, this is the last disk, the radius has actually changed it, so the y value is, is a variable and it's changing, okay? So what we've got is, we've effectively got, um, not pi r squared, h, but pi y squared, because y in this case is the radius, and then delta x, okay? That's the volume of each one of these cylinders, okay? Good, I'm hoping that made sense to you. And what we need to do is just add these together. Sigma, for add them together, between x is equal to, I said a and b, so between x equals a and b, and silly me, I should have left a bit of space. You'll see why I should have left a bit of space. So let's just rub that out and do that again. So x equals a, x equals b, that's better, of pi y squared delta x, okay? So we're gonna add all these together, okay? No matter how many disks we've got, we're gonna add the total volume of all these disks together. That gives us an approximation, of course, yeah, not exact. What do we do to get it exact? Lovely. We make delta x tend towards zero. The reason I left the space is because I'm going to write it as a limit this time. Because it looks better as well. Okay. The limit as delta x tends towards zero. These disks, cylinders, become infinitely small in height. And that way you get an infinite summation and you get the precise volume. Okay, And so this becomes, so I'm going to write equals, and if I put the pi outside, okay, integral of, and that's the difference between a sigma summation and an integral summation, this is an approximation, when we're trying to find a volume or an area, this gives us an exact, okay, and in case you forgot it, remember that's Greek letter S, that's integral letter S, elongated S, okay, um, pi and y squared, and then dx, remember the delta becomes d when it's 10 towards zero, okay? So that's it, that's our formula, okay? I'm not sure which bit you're going to write down, but you could just write down this, okay? The volume is equal to that, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rub this off as well, because I don't really need that bit. Um, I think that bit worked well, actually. The um, doing the whole thing underneath the x-axis as well, because before I've just been asking people to imagine. No idea why for years I hadn't done that, but there you go. Always improving, no matter how used to this you get, you can always improve somewhere. And I drew a dodgy rectangle on one of my early videos, so I'm gonna try and draw a slightly better one this time. I think it's not perfect, but I'm not using a ruler, am I? There we go. Volume is pi y squared dx. Okay. That's your formula. Next, I'll show you some examples of how to apply that.